one. Welcome, everybody. This is our fourth episode in The Selfish Lovers. It is a pleasure to be with Nikos uh, discussing a subject that I think it's going to be relatable to everyone tuning in from different parts of the world. So thank you very much. If you're watching, we are live through the Anne Rand Center UK, who have, uh, they have amazing uh, conversations on different topics. And in The, in the Selfish Lovers, well, we're talking about uh, you know, relationships and, and how you can learn from a philosophical point of view how, how to have uh, better experiences. And today we're going to discuss uh, with uh, some millennials, they, they are also going to tell us their experience. This article uh, that both was viral in, in Latin America, someone translated it and, and it, in, it it had a lot of attention and also uh, in, the, in the United States from a website called Wingman. And the article, uh, it's about why there are nine powerful reasons why dating as a millennial has become messed up. Uh, so we were discussing with uh, Nikos uh, this, uh, this topic and Nikos was very excited <laughs> to talk about it. And we actually will have uh, people also uh, sharing their experience. So I think uh, we're gonna have a very interesting show today. So yeah, so most people agree that for some reason, romance and sex is a struggle for millennials. And there are four things that are happening at the same time. So either people have sex for the first time quite later than they used to, or when they become, when they have a sexual experience, then they have sex less and less frequent. So if you ask people when that was the last time you had sex, this gap grows. The third thing is that most people identify as celibate, either voluntary celibate or involuntarily celibate, which means that they don't have an active sex life. And the fourth thing is that more and more people say that they are actually not enjoying sex. And there's also this discussion nowadays about the orgasm gender gap. So we used to talk about the pay gender gap. Now it's also the orgasm uh, gender gap according to which men enjoy sex more and women do not enjoy sex. Now, the very interesting thing here is that there are so many different explanations about what this happened. People are going to say uh, it's actually because uh, people don't take uh, sex seriously, or it's because of feminism, or it's because of porn, or it's because of male entitlement. So right. the, the, the point is to figure out why this is the case. And is it indeed more difficult today to find fulfillment, sexual or romantic? Because we have the sexual liberation. We have all these apps, all these dating apps, that no matter what your interest is, even if you're in a so-called niche sexual interest market, you can, all, you can still find people. And there, So it should be the case that we'd have an overabundance of sex and romance. So normally the episode should be, why can't we stop having a fulfilling sexual and romantic lives? But looks like it's the opposite. So let's start from the beginning. So do you think that indeed there is an issue or do you think that we live in times where we try to find problems everywhere? So actually it's a very millennial thing to say, oh, my sexual life is such a problem. So what's happening here? Uh, I think that there's a mix of uh, different elements, Nikos, because on top of everything you mentioned, which is actually a reality for a lot of, of uh, young people, and when we say millennials, it's uh, people that are in between right now 25 to 35 years old. So we are not even analyzing the previous generation uh, or the later generation, better said, that they were born with Wi-Fi. They don't know a world without uh normal uh, three-dimensional social interaction in what sex and dating is about because they are born already with uh, internet as the main source as to you know relating to each other so millennials uh, are previous the internet era during the internet era so we are quite of a mix of both this uh, old school way of having love letters that, that you can may have from high school, right? That were like handwritten 
and also learning how to swipe left and right using Tinder, especially if you didn't uh, marry young. But even if you marry young in cultures like the Mediterranean in Europe or Latin America, if you get divorced, you're basically thrown into this new world of dating that is completely different than what it was when you were an adolescent. So I think that on top of all the things that you mentioned about uh, the difficulties in sex and uh, a lot of interaction uh, through internet, but not in real life, we're also living in a pandemic for the past year. So, you know, a normal interaction has not been possible, although it has been reported that intimacy and uh, the, the, the seriousness of topics discussed in the dating apps got way much deeper than it was previous to COVID because people had no alternative but getting to know each other that way. So all that being said, I do think there's a difference and there's more of a pressure where you have all the market available to you in the internet as it was before, where it was more, you know, like going to a bar or getting to know someone in a party. And I think that um, it, it's also why bullying uh, and trolling has become more exponential. Once you are behind a screen, you automatically feel some distance as to how you, you are supposed to act towards another person. So it's not the same. And, and, and this is one of the, of, of the nine reasons that we're going to discuss each of them. But it's not the same to say goodbye to someone looking to them in the eyes than just never replying to a message. It's not the same even sending a naked part of your body to the internet than literally getting naked and having someone watching you getting naked. So I think that it has its pros and its cons. And I do believe that because we are a generation that is not dealing with a world war or, well, yeah, we're dealing with a pandemic, but we're doing it having internet and, you know, having food being delivered to us. But because we're not like facing, I don't know, a huge depression or a huge world war, it is true that we have more time as to complicate our existence into relationships. Also because traditional marriage and religion are a, every time, you know, getting, getting further off from, from our realities. So, yeah, uh, in a way, the discussion is similar to the discussion about snowflakes. So what I don't like when we call young people snowflakes is that we omit that we are the generation that created the, quote, snowflakes. So let me give you an example. Many people claim that the problem that young people have with dating is this risk aversion they have, that they consider everything a danger. So if you, if you Google the most famous articles about millennials and dating, you're going to find people who say, I don't want to expose myself. It's very dangerous either in terms of STD or even more. I'm going to get hurt. This is exactly the world we created. When we tell people that everything is A, a risk, and also an, an experience which needs to be perceived as a psychological risk. So you'd never mm -hmm. say, you'd, even, in, even in the biggest tragic, uh, tragic Uh, romantic stories. There was some glory in this tragedy, right? Like Romeo and Juliet or even un, unrequited love. We would see this as a glorious experience that at least I experienced it. Yes, maybe I'm hurt, but what, what a celebration of existence. Now it's, I'm, so, I'm going to keep myself away from the market because I don't want to get hurt. So it's this world which we are very, very risk averse. And you see it in everything, our relationship with the environment, our relationship with technology. Everything is don't touch because this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is dangerous. So the other thing that you mentioned is uh, you alluded towards the, what we call ghosting, which you meet someone and, uh, yeah. and then you disappear. To be honest, I didn't even know the term ghosting. So I missed the glory days of the first years of Tinder, because I was in a, how to call it, a committed, let's say, long uh, time relationship. So yeah. when I was, let's say, in the market again, Tinder was already a big thing. So there were many things I didn't know. So this ghosting thing, this also tells me that there are many young people who are not used to face-to-face -face interactions in two yeah. ways. A, they are not used to approaching other people. So they consider it's a scary experience. 
but also they lack the skills to negotiate these difficult situations where you have to tell someone, look, I don't, uh, I'm not in love anymore or we need, to, we need to end it. But again, I don't want to go all in like uh, sounding like a boomer to say, ah, young people don't have social skills. Because in a yeah. way, we are teaching them these things. So for example, you can hear people saying in schools, oh, don't have a very close friend because that is excluding other kids. So the way we raise kids makes it more and more difficult for them to navigate this world by themselves. So the kids go to uni, for example, and the university is a continuation of school rather than them being independent and taking life in their own hands. So that's why I'm a bit unwilling to say that this is the fault of the new generation. I'm not saying that you're saying it, but many, in many articles, you see this kind of, oh, uh, millennials don't know how to do things. I think this is the world they find themselves and you have to be very brave and independent to be able to take all this BS aside and say, I'm gonna live my life. And be very brave into falling in love and uh, and be crushed by it because what is happening is that the risk aversion it takes over their lives and it's the same uh, is the same logic behind safe spaces in universities right I will protect you from racism by not making racism something that can be discussed I will protect you from patriotism by not discussing about the wonders of your country and if the the, the result is completely the opposite. If you protect and protect someone from uh, the miseries of the world or the things that are uncomfortable or the topics that need to have philosophical discussion, what you are creating is not superheroes that are super brave and that can take care of their emotions. What you create is literally snowflakes. So the, the, the intention of protecting people from heartbreak is actually making them more miserable. The intention of saying to them, look, Look at all of this fletora of uh, fresh flesh that you have on Tinder is creating actually very miserable human beings who are so afraid of engaging in something more than a one night stand. And even if they do, they don't even know, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that if you're gonna have fun with someone, even if it's gonna be five minutes or a week or five months, whatever the time you spend with someone, it should be a time of fun and reciprocity and where both uh, persons or uh, feel you know, comfortable enough with each other. So it doesn't matter how long the relationship is gonna be. It's not about the mentality of everybody has to get married. No, it's about you know, certain code of, I don't know, uh, ethics, I would say, on how to treat someone else with respect, not as an object. But what ends up happening is that because you're so afraid of getting hurt, then you end up hurting yourself even more. And, and I would like uh, for us to, you know, discuss with the audience like of, of these nine approaches and, and reasons, what are the ones that, as you perfectly say, you can just rebel against them and say, yes, this is the world that we're living, but that doesn't mean that I have to be that way. And also you mentioned the audience. Uh, let's remind our audience that they can ask questions via Super Chat on YouTube. Razi is behind the scenes and he's gonna let us know if there is yes. a question. So here's something else that I find very interesting. There is some similarity in the narrative of the people who complain about the dating scheme today with leftists, because they both say that we live in a free market, in an unregulated market, and this has ruined everything. And see how this applies to dating. So what they say is, for example, this. Let's say, Gloria, you, know, you, are, very, you, are, you are very pretty, everyone notices you. In the old world, the pool of possible suitors, let's say, or people who would want to have an affair with you would be, let's say, the hot guy at, the, at work, the hot guy at your gym, and some people you might know from your social circle, and let's say some people who would be brave enough to come and talk to you in a bar. Now, with social media, this pool is almost endless. So what they say is we see an 80-20 situation where 20% of men get the attention of 80% of women, which means that there's nothing left for everyone else, but also Whereas the, the neighborhood sweetheart, for example, back in the day, you would have a chance. Now you don't have a chance because you have celebrities, athletes, promoters, 
emailing her or DMing her on Instagram. Therefore, uh, this creates inequality. So the same people who complain about income inequality, there's a similar argument when it comes to when it comes to dating inequality. So do you think this is a thing? And then we're going to bring in our first millennial to see to take her approach on the topic. I do. I, I, I do believe uh, there is a marvelous movie that they have done in different languages in Spain, in Italy, in France and also in Mexico. And it's called The Perfect Strangers. And it's about this, uh, this group of friends and they play this game during dinner where they had to put their cell phones on top of the, of the dinner table. And the game is that they will read every text, every email, every Facebook inbox, every Instagram DM that they get at loud. Of course, all the, all the movies with the same uh, trauma, what they project is that we're living two lives. There's one life and that endless supply and demand in our phones. And then there is reality of what is really going on. So even the people that are complaining about these inequalities, they're also playing the game, right? Because it's so easy that you can approach someone by an inbox and then never, uh, you know, respond again in one month, but the connection, the supposed connection is there. So it's like if you go to the supermarket and instead of like taking the products back home, you say, well, you know what? I'm going to put a tag on this coffee. I might return for it in, I don't know, maybe six months from now. And let's see about these cheese. Well, maybe in two years, I will contact this. And, and then you have all these guarantees of, of, you know, further contacts in the future, which are not guarantees at all, because at the same time, the coffee is also playing its own game and the cheese is also playing its own game. So I do believe that um, the market for dating has changed. And that implies uh, talking about the proper philosophical approach to it in, in order to have human beings that are actually having more sex and are actually having more relationships. It's fine if they wanna say goodbye to the traditional way of doing things, but what is going to uh, be the replacement of that? Is it only going to be interactions on the phone and wh what we like to call with my friends, uh, psychic vampires who live in your phone, but are, ne are, are nowhere to be seen in real life, you know what I mean? Yeah, to be honest, it's better to have them on, because these people would say, yeah, but I don't even have this on my phone. Anyway, let's welcome our first uh, call for today. Hi, Maria, are you with us? Hi. Hey, Good. Maria. So, Hi. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So, so Maria, you would, we would say that you are in this, let's say, 20% of the, the, the privileged elite. So is your life nowadays with uh, social media and dating apps and all that stuff, do you think that you live in a world of unlimited opportunity and it's better than any time before and it's like the dream coming true? I think it's definitely better than any time before because having options is always a good thing. But, you know, I second what, what you and Gloria have said earlier. An abundance of options leaves you to this sort of like um, paradox where you go to the supermarket and you, you don't end up going home with anything. So it definitely complicates things. Um, yeah, and I think it also just makes us far too quick to write people off for any minor detail. So in that sense, it's definitely harder. Right, so is this then that there's all this discussion that specifically women supposedly expect this Mr. Perfect. And when you have a line of 18 other potential Mr. Perfects on your phone, does this put does this put let's say a burden on you saying i'm gonna commit to this guy probably a little bit because again you know it's nice to have attention but at the same time you kind of feel well if i meet someone that i like you know but i still have another whatever 15 unanswered messages in my phone yeah you know it's it's nice but it's also it's scary um and i think that's people just go into this texting loop that never ends because you it's like a conveyor belt you know one bag you know goes away and the next one comes so and it's <laughs> but I think it's the same for guys as well I think actually more for guys because women still think of and I'm you know this is maybe a generalization but women probably still think of dating uh, as you know I will meet my Mr. Right 
But for men, a lot of the time, you know, he's just standing there at the bus stop waiting for the bus to come. And he's like, well, I'm going to whip my phone out, quickly swipe on Tinder, you know, and and probably a lot of the time not even strike conversation with a girl, whereas she thinks that any potential match that they have, like, could that be my Mr. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> but don't you both think that since social media and Tinder came about, what you would consider, let's say, in this very cheap way that people use the scale. So we don't say that this is a good say, but you know, people give 10, mm -hmm. eight, nine. So do you think that now what constitutes for you an eight is completely different from what would be the case 10 years ago or when we were in university and mostly we would date from people in our group. So, you know, then your girlfriend is the most beautiful girl in the world. Now the girl from your social circle is just, yeah, you know, it's not bad, but see what's happening here. So. Do you think that now your standards are way more unrealistic, but also that what constitutes a hot guy is completely different than pre-social media? I think we're definitely more critical with social media. And again, that all comes down to the fact that it's readily available there in front of us. And we have far more time to scrutinize people for any minor thing. Um, and again, that leads to the point that I said earlier, where we'll write people off for, for anything that we dislike about a picture. And it's a shame because obviously there's a there's a person behind it. And a lot of the time, especially for guys, I think it's harder to find nice pictures of themselves. Um, so, it, yeah, it, you know, you're, it's not a real representation of who the person is. So I think, you know, when you go to online dating or, you know, um, dating via apps, like you need to keep yourself in check a lot of the time as well and just make sure that, you know, am I being overly critical or, you know, am I being overly picky? It's not bad to have standards. It's good to have standards um, because at the, at the end of the day, you know, you don't want 30 random guys messaging you. You want three that are actually, you know, really worthwhile messaging you. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would probably say because of the, the higher percentage of scrutiny, maybe the levels of hotness have changed in some regard. Um, it doesn't help that also, obviously it's, it's much easier to deceive people with your looks on social media because um, you, know, you have filters, you have lighting, you have makeup. It's not the same in, in, yeah. in real life. Um, but yeah, but, you know, but much like dating in real life or, or seeing someone across the room, you know, the first barrier, the first um, layer that you see is the physical layer. So that's undeniable, whether you meet someone across, you know, the university hall or across the bar, or whether you meet them, see their picture um, on Tinder, um, you know, that is all, that will always be the first barrier of judgment, I think. Here's the web barrier, which I think is higher. By the way, sorry, Gloria, I've monopolized this guest. We'll do <laughs> monopolize the next it's guest. It's okay. It's okay. So you see someone you like in a party or in a bar. Already you have things going on for you. Your presence, you are the life of the party or the way you stand, the way you move. When you have to break the ice with a message, it's so much more difficult. And I really feel for the guys who send the, hey, beautiful message, which is obviously a recipe for disaster. But then there is a, there is like what, so, okay, let's, we say we don't give advice to people, but let's give some advice. So I'm gonna ask both of you, okay. How does a guy approach you in the era of social media and Tinder? Like what's the proper approach? Because obviously you don't want someone telling you the story of their life because then there's no mystery. And if you ask me, without mystery, women are gonna be very disappointed with you. That's not the position of ARC UK, that's just me. But also then you have all this usual stuff. Hey, hi, how are you? It's obviously, it's, it's not the way to go. So what is the way to go for a gentleman today to gain, let's say the interest of uh, the romantic interest in social media or in dating apps? I mean, I, I guess I probably am not the best person to speak to for, for all the girls um, looking for love on, on, on social media, but I always found that the slightly, the slightly weird opening line is always a, better way to get someone's attention well because a it sets you aside from all the other messages but also it shows a little bit of your personality like I feel like you know people have become so humorless um so it's nice when you open with something funny or something weird or something that catches the girl off guard you know maybe there's something that you noticed about her pictures or whatever or sometimes it's just maybe something even a little bit rude but but again you know it's risky it's risky but I feel like 
If you're that kind of guy who has that sense of humor, definitely go for that opening line. If the girl doesn't get it, why pursue the conversation with her anyway? And if she does, then, you know, bingo, you, you know, that the conversation will flow and there might be potential for something there. I, I do agree with Maria. I never have had a, a dating app. Uh, and Rasi was saying, oh, because you're famous. And yeah, maybe maybe that's one of the reasons. But definitely, I think that humor is what gets you on the way. Every time that I've seen Tinder on the phone of a friend of mine, I, I, I watch the pictures of the guys. And then I think of the guys that I've dated. And I think of, of the fact that if they would be there and I would see them on a picture, I would have probably swiped what is it left like to discard them. And, and, and then I said, this is such an unfair game because the guys that I actually have even developed feelings for, if they would be in this app and I just watch a, see a picture of them, I probably wouldn't pick them. So I think that definitely humor is, is a way to go. And, uh, and when, when you're in a bar and, and someone approaches you and, and like Maria says, that, that line that gets you off the guard, it's, it's absolutely marvelous. That's for the starting, right? And then uh, what I wanted to, to ask Maria is in that endless texting because of the filters and the makeup and, and all the things that you can do uh, for a picture, some people don't even risk it into going to a proper, you know, real life date. And then you can be in this endless texting for, I don't know, months or whatever. But what I find interesting is uh, there's a, a disparity in the conversations. People that have never met uh, in real life, they have this uh, romantic way into their texting, right? They are, hey, gorgeous, how's it going? And then with people that already dated, and let's say they have been go going down in two dates, then the game of who cares less starts happening, right? And it's like, why? why? <laughs> How is it that with people that you already dated in real life, you're going to keep on your guard? And with people that you haven't dated and you don't even know if they look like their picture, uh, you're going to be, you know, like more, I don't know, more caring or more open or more even, and, and even the humor that you use changes, right? For sure. I mean, it's exhausting. The game you have to play or the self-inflicted game, it's the worst because, you know, you're constantly doubting yourself, you know, never double text, never be the first one to text after, after a date, uh, you know, never be, you know, never make sure that you're never the one who's like left hanging after a conversation. It's, it's terrible. Um, and it definitely, I mean, again, I don't know if it's self-inflicted, if, if maybe things aren't as difficult as, as we make them out to be, but the fact that we know of these things existing means that they surely do. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of the time, you know, you either lose interest or the other, you drive the other person away or somehow the conversation just fizzles out because no one wants to be the one to show that they care more. So having said that, Let's say you have a male friend, not a boyfriend, friend. And he asks you, oh, I just went on a date. It was nice. Shall I text here? Oh, I had such a nice time. I can't wait to see you again. Sincerely, what advice would you give? Um, I, might, I, might, I might sound a bit like a hypocrite. Look, I always think it's, it's good to keep the other person on their toes, but you can only, you know, you can't play the, the game forever. Like eventually you're going to, you know, you're going to either develop feelings for each other you know you and you want to show the real you as soon as possible because otherwise you know what's the point of this like tug of war um just because I don't know who the girl on the other side is that's dating my friend I would always say well you know wait a little bit but don't you know never wait too long because you never want the other person to think that you lost interest or that you're seeing someone else on the side because if you genuinely like the person you know it's 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 difficult to find people to like you know despite the plethora of, of options that we have so yeah you know don't scare someone away just because you're scared to show your own feelings for them yeah okay I so, so I agree here's... with maria go on gloria no I, I just wanted to say that knowing my male friends what my first question would be 
are you sure that's what you're feeling? Don't say something that you actually are not feeling. You know what I mean? My advice would be don't say more than you're actually feeling because then you're going to get in a mess. And it's what happens to most of my male friends. They have, they, they start saying things to different girls and then they are in this position of, oh, now I don't know what to do. They're all in love with me. No wonder because of all the things that you said, right? So it's like, you know, keep your ex the expectations of the other person on check as well with the things that you're saying. So here's an un unorthodox approach. Don't try this at home or maybe do. So here's the thing. Maria gave me an idea. If you like someone, maybe try this. Again, that's not advice. This thing out loud. Be yourself, which is a horrible advice normally, but be yourself as a filtering mechanism of seeing who likes you. Because at some point you will be yourself. So the person who doesn't, who's not going to like you, she's going to not like you in five months, which is going to be even worse. So maybe a very radical approach is to be yourself, although it's probably going to be disastrous in eight out of 10 situations. The two out of 10 situations when it's going to work, it will really work because that person likes you for who you really are. So there's gonna, not going to be drama down the way. Now, realistically and cynically, is this a good approach, you think? Depending on what you want, I think that one of the problems with all of this is what's your end goal? If you don't know where you're going, any road is good and any road can take you. And, and then you, need, you don't even know if the game is self-inflicted or something that you use because you don't know where you want. I think that most people have to ask their, themselves the question, do I want a long-term relationship? Or do I only want a one night stand? And if I only want a one night stand, why would I, I apply long term relationship strategies for a one night stand? And why would I apply one night stand strategies for a long term relationship? Which I think is what's happening, right? It, we're using the wrong premises for, uh, for goals that don't need those premises to, to happen. Right. Looks like we're out of time uh, for our first guest. So thank you very much, Maria. So you gave us many good ideas. And again, people try this, you know, worst case, what's going to happen? Apparently, there's not much action taking place nowadays. Worst case, it's going to stay the same. Best case, it's going to work. So thank you very much, Maria. Thank and you let's bring me. our second guest today, which is Tom. Tom, are you with us? Hi, Nikos. Yes, I'm here. Hi, hey, Tom. Tom. Hey, Gloria. How are you so guys? I think I talked too much with our previous guest, Gloria. So I'm going to leave the <laughs> I'm going to leave the field to you now. So, Tom, welcome uh, to this inquisition about millennials and dating. I don't know if you had the chance to uh, check on the nine reasons why supposedly millennials are more miserable in love. And what what were your take on on those nine reasons be like? What are the ones that you find? Oh, this is completely self-inflicted or, or this is something that you just have to do because, you know, that's the way the game is. Uh, I actually haven't had a chance to look at that, but I can certainly speak to my own experience of like the sort of discovery journey I went on as to why relationships go wrong and, and how you can get them right. So um, it's, I, I've had, I had a bit of interesting experience because I certainly, I went through a period of using, you know, online dating systems and, and, you know, trying to, trying, rushing into relationships that clearly weren't right um, for a long time. And um, I think the thing I realized after a while is that you sh the best way to find relationships, to find someone who's right for you and makes you happy is to pursue the things that you like in your life and value in your life anyway. So all, all of my successful relationships have come from me getting involved in things that I was interested in or things that I value, like mm. objectivism and philosophy, uh, like my other interests, transportation and you know, movies, things like that. Like all, following the things you're interested in and finding people who share those interests. Uh, my experience of, of trying to make relationships happen for their own sake and not coupling them to your other values is that you get very few hits and the ones you do get that aren't right. Like, so what does this mean though for, for the new digital world? So does it mean that because you can specialize it so much, so let's say your interest is uh, climbing or Jiu Jitsu, for example, you can, I'm sure there's an app for uh, <laughs> Jiu Jitsu or for climbers or for uh, uh, Marxist libertarians, whatever. So do you think that this, 
the stuff that you can specify up to the tiniest percent that's what exactly you want. Do you think that makes it easier or does it feel like you're ordering a pizza and you put the ingredients and you expect the pizza, but that's actually not, 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 not what's going to happen? Yeah, no, that's too much. And, and you end up going in with expectations that, that aren't realistic. I think that's another big problem with relationships is you mustn't go in with an idea of what this person yeah. is supposed to be. You, you have to fall in love with what, who the person actually is. So I think, yeah, if, if you kind of, the problem with dating apps generally, if you window shop for, for a partner and then you pick the one that you, you like the best, you, you have this mental construction of, of who they are before you've even got anywhere in a relationship with them. Uh, so I think what, the, the way that millennials can use technology creatively is to build networks and discover people who share your interests and your values more broadly, like use it to do things like this, like meetups and, and, you know, get involved in groups and do the kind of thing you couldn't do 20 or 30 years ago, where you couldn't easily meet people who share your interests if they're in other parts of the world or other parts of the country. But now you can do that. And then within that, that creates more opportunity for the right connections to happen naturally. You still have to have that natural element. I think trying to force it is where people go wrong. You have to be willing to and patient to let things develop naturally but you can create the opportunity for that to happen by building these networks and making connections with technology and what happens oh sorry go ahead Mikhail. no no go on go on sorry i talked too much no today. i i want no it's, it's fine i wanted to ask you, tom what happens if you find someone that shares your same interests uh but that doesn't necessarily mean they share your same values. For example, you can like, I don't know, music and movies and certain sports and you find someone that is like that. But when, when values come to place, it's completely different. And then you find yourself in saying, well, yeah, I, I have fun with this person. Realistically, I cannot build a long-term relationship, but I'm going to stay here because at least in the values that we, uh, no, not the values, the interests that we share, we can have fun. Is that possible in the dating apps where, where everybody, you know, uh, seems to be in these unrealistic expectations of perfection where everybody knows a little bit about everything? Uh, I mean, my thinking would be that that sounds more like a friend than a, than a relationship. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think it's perfectly fine to have friends who don't share your values, provided that that's not such a fundamental clash that you know you're sort of breaking your own values in in, in not standing up to those like I, i've had re a very recent experience of you know having to uh, having a friendship fall apart because the values were too divergent and i couldn't just ignore it i had to say i think your you know your values are just bad and, and like sometimes you have to pick that up but that doesn't mean that everyone you you're close to has to have your exact values and you know there, there's room for flexibility there the more important mm. thing I find is that you understand that the person, whether it's a friend or a romantic relationship, the person has the right core value. Like, you know, they're actually someone who wants people to be happy, wants people to be successful, wants the best for you and the best for, you know, for what wants to, you know, has, has good in their heart, essentially, even if their you know, political opinions aren't yours or, you know, their yeah. integration of that's wrong. As opposed to someone, you'll often meet people as well who share your out your overall political and social ideas, but you can tell their value premise underneath that is wrong, uh, and you know they're, they're narcissistic or hedonistic or you know controlling, predatory, and you know you, you've you've got to try and know a person at a deeper level than that before you can make that decision. So can right. I ask a question, Tom? So you have uh, you are very active in the in the objectivist movement, but also. Uh, from your Instagram account, you're very, very passionate about traveling and your, let's say, public Instagram profile is mostly that person who travels a lot and you share a lot of nice pictures and stuff. Have you got any experience or story to share where one of the two managed to open the door, let's say, for an interesting romantic endeavor? So these two passions of yours and how you use social media to tell the world, this is who I am. I mean, yeah, so my girlfriend is in Wisconsin at the moment. So we've been, um, you know, apart because of coronavirus, obviously we've not been able to see each other for eight months and we've had to carry that on digitally. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't have met her if I didn't travel the way I do. Um, both, I mean, you know, my interest in objectivism and my interest in travel have benefited each other. 
Uh, and both of those together enabled that relationship to happen and, and indeed another one before it and a, a number of good friendships, um, including you guys really. And, you know, it's my, my interest in objectivism and my interest in travel took me to the US. And then each made the other possible. So I, you know, my people say, how do you do a 15 hour flight, you know, and, and the weird flights I do like go up to Canada and then down into America and stuff. And it's like, cause I love travel. But then I also want to go to these conferences and meet these people. And then I make these incredible connections and meet just people who add so much value to my life. So um, yeah, like me pursuing my passion for travel and my passion for philosophy led me to an incredible relationship. But all of my good relationships that I've had over the years have come from me pursuing an interest like that, whether it was an interest in, um, you know, sort of, I, I was, I've been like debating meetups and I went to a, a Harry Potter studio tour, how I met my previous girlfriend before that. And like, you know, just following the interest and doing stuff is what leads to good relationships. I've, I had like two matches in about two years of trying dating apps. And, and, you know, one of them led to one date and it was just obviously was wrong. Like you could just, you could, it's like, it's like you're pressing five random keys on a piano. It's just like, and like you know, it's not right when it's not right. And, um, and other, equally, yeah, when, when you do hit the right chord, then you, you feel that as well. You know, it's, I, mean, I don't mean to be mystical about it, but you know, you have a, a sense of you, 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 an intuition of when things are working, when they're not. I, I want to end the, my part of the interview with Tom on a positive note. So Gloria, <laughs> any final points for Tom? Yes, uh, uh, now that you mentioned philosophy and interests, uh, one of the reasons why, of these nine reasons why millennials are, you know, so uh, miserable in love, uh, involve, of course, unrealistic expectations. They don't want to be responsible for the other person's feelings. And the other one is they're always doubtful, not only doubtful of themselves and how to text the other person, and, but also doubtful about expressing their feelings or hiding their feelings and the constant question if maybe the other person is with someone else too since there's so little communication um and people are not being transparent on what they feel because the person that feels the most is the one that loses how how for you tom is it uh, is it better to pursue your interests in philosophy and traveling in order for you not to restrict yourself in what you're feeling or have you found yourself in moments where you said, wait a minute, as an objectivist, I am checking my emotions and yes, I'm feeling something very deep for this person, but I'm not going to say anything. Have you ever found yourself in a position of playing the game? Because even if you have this philosophy and this interest, you feel like, no, I, I, I have to, you know, play the game and, 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 you know, make the appearance that I don't have any interest in this girl? No. Um, so a couple of points there. I mean, so even before objectivism came into my life, I've always been very much honest about my feelings and in touch with my feelings. And, um, there's, you know, I, I've never believed, I, 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 a sort of British idiom I quite like is call a spade a spade. Like I like to just identify things for what they are and own them. So if I have feelings, I just say it. Uh, and acknowledge it you know I, I don't believe in beating about the bush on these things so um and you know sometimes obviously you know you don't want to ruin a friendship by admitting you have feelings for someone so you, you try to find ways of more subliminally showing it but you have to do that internal thought process of figuring out is this a healthy relationship for me to pursue or not is this in line with my values or not and then move from there um one thing I would say, you said uh, worrying about the other person's feelings. You, you only should ever worry about, you know, what your actions cause for others. You, you know, some, how somebody else feels isn't your responsibility. So, um, you know, be, be mindful. Even why, you know, it's, it's, it's more about make sure you're not intentionally harming someone else. But you, yeah. know, you, you don't need to analyze everything you're doing in terms of how this is going to make this other person feel potentially because you don't know that. You don't know their context and you know we've all had experiences where you know you try the same thing with different people and it causes a completely different reaction and often for reasons that you have no control over or no responsibility for so um but how how, how do you draw the line tom uh for example reason number six is actually yeah we don't want to be responsible if we hurt someone's feelings it's not a problem it's theirs that's the millennials present day mantra we don't feel the tiniest bit of remorse or the need to apologize for hurting someone or making someone feel bad 
Not true for everyone, of course, but uh, it's not our problem to resolve someone's emotions, even if we were the cause behind it. We feel entitled to act that way because we don't, we don't want to take responsibility. So how, how do you draw the line into saying, uh, objectively, I harmed someone by, I don't know, not being honest, uh, ghosting, not replying on a message, or, or, or saying someone, uh, like, I've, I've seen this happening all over the place. People sharing super deep feelings, like, I love you, I'm super interested, and then three days later, a week later, boom, vanished. And if the other person is hurt and looking for answers, the advice of the friends is don't do anything. Don't go and try to find that person. That person knows where you are. They know how to find you on Facebook, on your cell phone. If they haven't reached you, it's because they purposefully don't want to reach you. But if you go and you express anger and you try to be like, hey, you actually hurt me because you said A and then you did B, that is always uh, seen as no, don't do that. You know, like like you you should you should just show that you don't care. Uh, how does that relate with being responsible for someone else's feelings? Um, so I think firstly, you know, you need to judge your own actions in line with your own values and your own ethics. So um, so you you gave a couple of examples. Like if you are dishonest and that hurt someone, yeah, you probably should you know doubt yourself and try to put that right because you violated your own ethical code at that point. You know, dishonesty, denial of truth, you know, that, that's not a virtue, mm. that's a vice. So, um, you know, if you've done something like that, then, you know, or if you've willfully hurt someone or if you've, you know, you've hurt someone through action that you know was wrong or that you know was mistaken, then, yeah, you should try to rectify that. If, if, you've, if you're ghosting someone because someone's, you know, bothering you, you don't have an obligation yeah. to consider their feelings in that sort of situation. You know, you, you need to act in your own self-interest. And if you, if that means protecting yourself from harm, even if it's going to hurt someone else, you absolutely should do that. And you shouldn't question, you know, or, or doubt yourself or put, expose yourself to harm because of your concern about somebody else's feelings. You know, people will recover from hurt feelings. And, um, and yeah, you need to go forward with your, yeah, well, that was the other thing I was going to say is that if, if you have your own self-interest at heart, then, you should know when to and when not to pursue something. So if, if a relationship isn't working or, you know, if somebody's not coming into contact with you who you wish was, yeah. then that's probably not someone who you want to be in contact with in the long term in your future. You know, it's probably not in your self-interest to keep pushing at this relationship that's causing you harm already. You're going to cause each other harm, but you're going to cause yourself harm fundamentally. So the, the self-interested thing to do there is to put that to one side. It's difficult. It's really hard to do this. But is to put that to one side and try and find a relationship that is in your self-interest where you can have this mutually beneficial trading relationship like you know we as objectivists seem to uniquely seek where two people equally give to each other well it doesn't need to be equally so to speak but you know where we're both trading value for value and you know we're both enhancing each other's lives you need to go and find those relationships and double down and this is what I do when somebody hurts me and a relationship goes wrong and I feel you know like I've been mistreated I, I think, okay, who does do what I need? And with whom do I have these kinds of positive interactions? I, how can I shift my investment from this harmful relationship into one of these good ones? And I'm using relationship broadly, romantically and friendship wise, but you know, it's, it's a matter of finding those relationships that do benefit you, that are in your self-interest. And if you pursue those, you'll help that other person and you'll avoid hurting yourself or the person who you were having the bad relationship with. So it's really, you know, so, follow your rational self you. interest in the whole process. So Do you we, think we a little another. Sorry, Gloria, I just, I just, no, I, I just wanted to ask him if, if he thinks that a little bit of tribalism would serve in, in, in the dating apps. Like the fact that people say, if you voted for Trump, don't swipe me. Or if you're an objectivist, yes. <laughs> Do you think that that, that, that is useful? Um, I don't know. I don't think that's tribalism, really. I think that's filtering by people's values. Like, right. you know, tribalism would be like, you know, I only want people who are, are from, well, even that's like, you know, that it's, it's up to you how you want to filter your relationship. You know, we're all attracted to different types of people. I don't think that's tribalist. But, you know, I think filtering for values is probably a good thing. But again, I wouldn't do that through an app. I would do that through getting to know someone. And, you know, I'm old fashioned in this respect. I, you know, and this is weird because my mom, who's 55, 
just mar- well, married a man a couple of years ago who she met through a dating app. Whereas I say, right. don't use dating apps, just meet people the old-fashioned <laughs> way. Yeah. Uh, and, and use the internet to accelerate that process. But um, yeah. no, I think you have to get to know a person. And sometimes they, their political ideas, they might have voted for Trump or for Jeremy Corbyn or whoever, you know, but you can tell that they're a good person. I have friends who voted for Jeremy Corbyn who I think are great people. They just have wrong ideas. I mean, you know, Nikos used to be a Nazis. You know, people change over time and you can get it, you can get to this. <laughs> and and you, if you find someone who's right, you can sort of, develop that relationship and help them on their journey to becoming a better person. So I think you have to do this naturally, let these things develop more naturally. I think that's the problem in millennial space is we expect everything, you know, straight away, instant service, you know, high speed broadband attitude to life. And so real life doesn't work like that. Real life is years of developing things and working slowly and, you know, patient. Uh, on, on, the, on the tribal you think, Although it's weird to put it in terms if you voted the labor. Once on my short time on Tinder, I had the photo with a fake lobster. And I was like, if you get the Jordan Peterson joke, no, I didn't say it, but I was thinking, if you get the Jordan Peterson joke, we're probably going to have a good time. If you don't get the Jordan Peterson joke and ask me what's that thing, it's probably not going to work. Anyway, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, we are <laughs> Thank you, happy Tom. to hear that uh, you know your life is going uh, is going well, and someone can be an objectivist and have a fulfilling uh, life, and that we're not like oh you know this thing which is uh, usually the usually the stereotype for people who are highly ideological. So thanks a lot, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> so Gloria, last last issue that we need to address because then our conservative friends are going to say that we that we are not brave enough to face it. So right. what about the argument that the problem with millennials today is that there is no polarity, that the idea that you have, let's say, femininity and masculinity and that someone leads or someone follows, or if you want it the other way around, but there is somehow this polarity. So how about the argument that Yes, of course, people are not going to be satisfied from the romantic life because we've taken away the number one thing which is important for this tension, which is this polarity that you have, let's say, different roles. And again, depending on your beliefs, someone has this role, someone has that role, but this difference in the roles is visible. Do you think that conservatives have any credits on making that claim? I do believe that if you are looking for a traditional relationship and and what you have in mind when you think of getting married and having kids is like the picture perfect of the 50s. um, Of course, the fact that femininity is being, uh, you know, in attack by the by the by the same feminists, like feminine feminists are more masculine sometimes than than the men. And of course, masculinity. And this is something that I've discussed with a lot of libertarian and and objectivist colleagues. Like, uh, I I think that men nowadays are, are in a role of saying, how am I supposed to be a man? Should I give flowers? Should I don't? Should I open the door? Should I not no, no, open the door? Should I invite for the dinner? I don't know. I don't know what to do, you know? And they become paralyzed in the sense that whatever they do can be used against them. Yes, I think that there are men that are afraid of that and women that will hold them accountable for either being too gentlemen, and that means that they are mach- macho, or, you know, not caring at all, and then they don't care about tradition. So for conservatives, of course, I think that this is an issue, because if what they have in mind is that traditional uh, way of, of, of having a relationship, this is definitely an issue. But let's say that there are millennials and centennials where, you know, uh, gender n- neutrality is, is, is not an issue and some um, guy that is super feminine can like a girl who is super masculine and they are both bisexuals. I think that they can have an amazing relationship, you know, not even being defined by the n- normal gender roles, if you want to call it like that. But that relationship is, gone, is not going to go further if there is not a values in common as Tom and, and Mary were, were saying before, you know, like the, the thing is, how do you establish, and, and I have a, a brilliant friend uh, who, who, who put it very, very good in the term of the unit, 
uh, and, and and this is credits to Avens uh, O'Brien and, and and her boyfriend, and they are the, like this libertarian couple. And Avens said to me once, once the unit is more valuable, if I have a problem with my partner or he has a problem with me, we both know that it's in our self-interest to, to solve that issue because the unit of us together is what we both value the most. And if that means opening the relationship or closing it in the 10, 10 years or whatever that they've been together, or you know, like uh, revising the contract every three months to see how we are in different aspects, then that's the goal. And I think that if you have clarity in the kind of relationship that you wanna have, uh, the, the gender roles become secondary in a world where there is you know, more diversity in that sense. Now, for conservatives, of course, this is an issue. I remember going to speak to CPAC in 2016. They asked me to give a talk about why do Latinos that escape socialism in Latin America do not vote Republican and they go and they vote Democrat. And I gave you know, a certain ex explanations of what that, ha what that happens. But then another lady comes into the stage and she starts saying like, eh, yes, we have to root for virginity and no sex before marriage. And then I read an article that said that a lot of STDs are always spread during the CPAC conventions by the young people that get together, right? And I, and I saw this woman talking and all the, 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 the young section of CPAC like, like applauding. And I remember going to them and saying like, do you actually believe in all this? Like, are you really going to wait until marriage to have sex? And, and, and they're like, of course not. But, you know, we're here and it's part of what. So, so one thing is what conservatives say. And the other thing is how they are also enriching their lives with all these dating apps and all this supply and all this demand, you know. Yeah, I mean, I bet if you became slightly flirty with a conservative, would other side said, oh, no romance before marriage, within five minutes, you'd probably have a rethinking of these values. So we have a super chat. So first of all, many thanks, Ed. Second, I need to move the camera to read it. So do you think that the trader principle relieves people from worrying about feelings and shifts the emphasis on the exchange of values? Okay, that's difficult. Uh, so does a trader principle relieve people from worrying about feelings and shift the emphasis on the exchange of values? What uh, is a trader my principle? My initial answer is no, but let's see what Gloria says and then I'll, I'll have a take on this. What, what is a trader principle? So, so he means probably in the objectivist way, which is that the trader principle says that even when it comes to love, there has to be this give and take of justice, which means... I value you, so this is the value I take from you. You value me, this is the value you take from me. As opposed to going to someone and say, for example, look, I'm suffering, therefore you have to love me. Or I suffer for you and therefore you have to love me. Or the even worse thing, I've done so many things for you, how dare you leave me or something like that. So the trader's principle is the opposite, let's say, of this idea that, uh, uh, you know, basically, uh, I am in need Therefore, you have to do something for me. Whereas the trader principle would say, for example, look, I get all the selfish value from you. You get the selfish value from me. So, you know, that's good. And so he, he, his question is, if two people are uh, with the trader principle having a relationship, if that uh, is an excuse for them not to feel responsible for the other person's feelings. That's my understanding. Yeah, so basically the idea is make sure you get value and don't... Uh, but... I would say, why, why do you have to divorce feelings from value? Because the way I would right. see it, because I get value, I have feelings. So in a way, you should protect yourself from emotions that you haven't examined. So let's say you, you are with someone who is, doesn't share your values, horrible person, make you feel bad, and yet you feel a big attraction. Then you need to ask yourself, why do I have these feelings? Something yes. weird is going on here. But the more the values, I would say, the higher the feelings, the, the more uh, putting together also the physical part and the attraction and all that stuff. So, Ed, I wouldn't see it feelings or values. I would see it feelings earn values and also see it as feelings without values. Something is wrong. What do you think, Laurie? 
I uh, absolutely agree. When your feelings, when, when there are feelings without values, it's probably because you are engaged in a, in a dynamic, like for example, the toxicity that can be created between an empathic person and a narcissist. We both feed each other, but not in a in a nurturing way or in a positive way, but they feed each other's necessities of, of negativities because the empath is in this constant uh, necessity of satisfying the narcissist. And the narcissist is someone that is never satisfied because once the, the, the person's ego has been filled, they would immediately disappear and they will come back when, when like their battery is already down and then they fill up from the empath again. But when you are in that kind of relationship, like Nico says, is because your values and your feelings are not in check. Uh, and, and I think that it does take a while for in order, and, and we were discussing this in the previous episode uh, in the Selfish Path to Romans, it does take a process for you to start understanding that you can develop feelings coming from uh, inner wounds that you haven't healed, and then you can develop feelings once you understand that for people that value the same things that you value. Right, yeah. So again, this is not, uh, this is not to say that there can be things that it's difficult to, ex to explain. And quite yes. often you might find that your body reacts in a way that not only you can't explain, but you know it's wrong. So this is not just to say, oh, this is the objectivist line, all problems are solved. Yeah, there has to be a lot of inner work and all that stuff. But on the surface of it, I don't think there is any dichotomy between... You, you could say, you, you could ask yourself, do I get value? But it is the case that you can get value, but then you see the other person as a friend. The spice is not there. The flame is not there. The attraction, the urgency is not there. In which case, actually, the rational is there could make the objectivist feel in trouble, in guilt. Like, oh, I share the values, but why am I not, uh, why am I not feeling the attraction? So, yeah, this is something that definitely needs to be avoided. Okay. The Lord Emperor behind the scenes is messaging me that time is up. Yes. Time flies. <laughs> so, time Gloria, flies thank you so much for words this to amazing you. episode. <laughs> thank you so much for this amazing episode Nikos I had a lot of fun and thanks to Maria and also to Tom and everyone uh, remember the Selfish Lovers is every Thursday and you can share this and keep discussing and send us your comments Nikos have a great evening thank you very much thank you Gloria thanks Tom and Maria thanks to our viewers thanks to Razi bye everyone bye